Uh, hi everybody, I'm Kyle Cordes at Oasis Digital and uh, today I'm going to present my second in the series of Angular 2 live coding videos about streaming data. Uh, last time I, I talked about very briefly how I was generating streaming data and then spent the bulk of the time on my first cut of an Angular 2 application to consume it. Uh, this time, in response to some questions I got, I'm going to jump into how this uh, test streaming data generator works. But uh, kind of a word from our sponsor here, I teach at Angular Bootcamp along with a bunch of other bright folks, and uh, we'd love to see you. If you're planning to build a big complex app with Angular 2, or Angular 1 for that matter, we can teach you how to do it. Okay, so as a reminder of how this program works, for those who saw it last time, uh, I've already run an NPM install, so I'm not going to make everybody wait for that. Then I'll do an NPM start to run the program. It's just a simple node server. Uh, and then I will refresh the page where it's serving this data right here. So this is not, not super interesting. It's just a flow of data. This data is randomly generated. And then there's a really lousy, simple piece of JavaScript to uh, keep you know, shoving it into the top of the screen as time goes on. So I guess I'll just let that run and go explain some of the code behind it. Um, so again, I'm going to explain the server code that generates the data. If you are looking for uh, more Angular 2 content specifically, please just skip this and go on to my next video. So I guess I should remind you, please subscribe to our channel so you get our next video. Okay, so here we are in the, uh, in the, the program here for this data generator. Um, you can read the README, it kind of gives you a little rundown of how it works, but I'm going to go into more depth here. Now, we do something a little bit different here at Oasis Digital. So, uh, much of the time when we write Node software, we use TypeScript in our Node software. This gives us all the numerous advantage TypeScript has for uh, scalable JavaScript for any other uses, and it means that there's a smaller gap between our client code and our server code. So we feel like it's a really good payoff, especially in your more complex applications, to go ahead and use TypeScript on both sides. Um, to see that in action, or to see how that works, let's take a look at the, at the package config file. The most important thing here is we have a dependency on the TypeScript compiler. Uh, we bring in a couple of types so that we can do typed code, and we bring in TSLint, and then that TSLint is actually integrated seamlessly with this IDE I'm using, so we get a little bit more help as we develop by having TSLint available. Now, that's pretty much all there is to it, except for running the TypeScript compiler. Now, I'm sure there's a way to get, in fact, I know there's a way because I configured it somewhere in another project, but I'm sure there's a way to get this IDE to perform my TypeScript compilation, but we think that would be a really bad idea. Uh, it's not at all wise to have an IDE responsible for production compilation. That's really something that should be as part of a build process in a project source code. And that entire build process is implemented essentially right here. So right here, we just, we just used a, a, one of the hooks in the node package scripts to fire off the TypeScript compiler, TSC. Um, by the way, for anybody who hasn't noticed, uh, this TSC does not require a global install of TypeScript. Anything you call from your package.json scripts will automatically find programs in your node modules bin, which means that even without a global install of TypeScript, you can get TypeScript to run in a project. And for that reason, I recommend never installing TypeScript globally. Because if you install TypeScript globally, now you've got a single version of TypeScript that you might accidentally use with all of your projects. And by doing this TypeScript locally and then calling it via a NPM script, I can, uh, I can get these benefits of controlling and knowing the version of TypeScript I'm using. OK, so let's go on here. Uh, we can see that to run, we're calling node and we're calling a, a file called main in the build directory. I don't even see a build directory. That's okay. Um, I think I have my IDE set to hide the build directory, but you can just believe me that it's there. Um, so this must mean that this TSC command must somehow put the files in this build directory. So let's see how that works. Uh, in a TypeScript project, you use the tsconfig file to set up how TypeScript is going to work. And there are some important bits to see here. So first, if you're using this new at types system to import TypeScript types, you want to have this type roots uh, paragraph here. Uh, next, I'm targeting Node. And I happen to know that it's 2016. It's almost the end of 2016. 
I have let go of old node versions. Now that we have a couple of customer things that rely on old node versions, but for any code that I write where I have control, old node versions are, go are gone. I only care about node six and higher, which means that I can set my TypeScript to emit ES6, and that's okay. The, the, the kind of the subset of ES6 that's implemented by node six is close enough to the subset of ES6 which will be emitted by TypeScript, that it just works. Uh, we had older projects where we had to have an additional, like a Babel compiler step to adapt between TypeScript and Node, and that's all gone for now, as far as we can tell. So just this simple TypeScript config, and we are off to the races writing TypeScript code. It gets compiled, it gets put in the build directory, and then we can run it in Node. Okay, so let's go look at the actual TypeScript code behind this program. It's a Pretty small program, uh, just three files. We'll start at the beginning here. So we have a pretty typical node program. It uses things like express, right? Nothing special there. But uh, we don't do the var express equal require express sort of thing. We do a TypeScript import, and this will bring in the type. So in this program, I have the types for express available. So if I were to go in here and type express dot something, uh, it can tell me that there is no such thing as that. that. That does not exist. In fact, it knows that the correct use of express is this use right here. So if I change this to something invalid, I get immediate help from TypeScript to tell me, oh, there's no such thing. Don't do that. Do this. Um, once I have a, uh, an app here, I can then get type help here also. So I can say, you know, well, you can see what they are anyway. So the, you get lots of help by using TypeScript that should be reminiscent of the help you got with powerful IDEs from other languages if you've used languages that have powerful IDEs. Okay, so back to the specifics of our program. Um, <clears throat> when you set up a, an express program, the kind of the, the two really important parts are to tell it how to handle certain HTTP requests and then to tell it to go ahead and listen. So the listen as simple as can be and then the uh, the only two really important requests here are these two relative URLs and we're just delegating those to these things called channels. Now where do the channels come from? Well the channels come from my other file here and uh, because of TypeScript I'm able just to import those in a named structured sort of way and it actually knows about some types but we'll see if any of those come up as we get there. Um, lastly, I have this section because for this little program, I, I wanted to be able to, to run this thing here and have this be served. And so I said, well, let's just uh, put some files in a WW directory and then they can be served by my same little express server. Okay, uh, the next file that that referenced was channels. So here I'm using a library called SSE channel. This was one of about, I don't know, five different libraries I found in the Node ecosystem for talking to server, uh, server sent events. Uh, it seemed to be maybe the most active one, so I sort of applied the rules we all do where you sort of look around the GitHub repository for projects to try to try to figure out which one is the most alive. And this is the one that seemed to be the most alive to me, so I grabbed this one. But there were no types. There were no TypeScript types available. So I was able to just do this the old way without types. And I could have typed var here, but it's of course more correct nowadays in 2016 to type const. So I'm bringing this in in the same way I would have brought in any other node library you know, before I heard of TypeScript or any of that. Now uh, you can mix and match. So I'm importing some function from another file. I'm doing that here. And then I'm, uh, I'm setting up a couple exports. So you should recognize these things that got imported from the channels file are the same two things I have exported from the channels file. Now this SSE channel library, this is pretty easy to use. So you take this thing and then you, uh, you just say new SSE channel and you give it some configuration. If you want cores support for your, for your SSE uh, URLs, you don't have to go dig up another library or anything. You just, you just ask for core support and you get it. Uh, this JSON encode, this tells it whenever data goes out the door, just apply JSON encoding to it so that I can take this channel and just tell it to please send some data and then that data gets formatted as JSON. So easy as can be. Um, uh, next, we <clears throat> by, by importing this file, we actually run these two lines of code, right? Because they're just sitting here at the top level. They're not inside a function or anything. And uh, 
What these do is these start a background process. Now the start FX generator, this function comes from another file, so we'll have to study that next. But uh, it looks like all we're providing this function is a arrow function, so this is a function or a closure or whatever, and then a, an, an interval of how often it should send data. So I guess this means uh, do some FX generator work, and then every 500 milliseconds do this operation. So it must be that the FX generator will call this callback function with some data. And then when that happens, we're just going to take this low frequency channel and we're going to tell it to send some data out. So if you, you could go and dig around how SSE channel works if you want. But the important thing is that if one or more client web pages has attached a, 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 an SSE event source to one of these URLs, uh, it could be a large number, by the way. So if they've done that, then when this thing calls this function, this low frequency channel send, it means send this data encoded as JSON to everybody who's connected to this channel. So this is a very high level, simple API for getting a, a server side data flow running. Um, so only one more file we haven't looked at, and this is this is this FX file. So this file really goes, I strongly recommend taking a look at this book. So this book goes into enormously more depth than I will in this, uh, in this video series, but you can read this book and you will learn enormous depths about how SSE works. And uh, I have been inspired by and borrowed an algorithm from that book. So I had to write this code because the book offers a PHP solution that, that didn't seem ideal for these videos. But uh, I did manage to use the algorithm it suggested to generate realistic uh, foreign currency exchange data. And uh, basically what it's doing is it's taking two different sine waves and overlapping them with each other and then adding some randomness along the way. So by doing those things, it uh, it generates these, you know, these, these, these up and down movements if you graph the data. And it, it may be several more videos in before we graph the data, but just trust me, it generates very nice data. Um, so pretty simple here. We just uh, we define this class. So TypeScript has classes, comes in very handy. We have this great private keyword, which means we don't have to write code to capture these values. They just get captured by saying private. And then we just expose this one function. That function is then called down here. So this start FX generator that we just looked at, uh, what this does is it says start an interval, so do something every so often. Um, by the way, we, we randomize that interval just a little bit so that each time you run it, you'll get a little bit different interval. Um, I guess what I really should do is randomize it on each cycle through because I have a comment saying that I simulate jitter. But as I look at this, I actually don't simulate jitter. So I'll have to think about how to edit this to truly simulate jitter. But uh, you could study the code in here in great detail. But the important thing is that every so often, <clears throat> it looks at what time it is. And then it generates data for one of these currency pairs according to this math. And then it calls a callback. That callback sends data into an SSE channel, and the SSE channel sends that data onward to zero or more connected web page clients. So the upshot of all of that is you run that program, and I, I think I have it running right here, and then you get this nice little data flow. Um, there are a couple little things you can try by hand if you want to get slightly more uh, in depth. So if you look at the readme file, I can run a curl command, and I can simply ask curl to request from that same URL. So let's see what I can do here. So here's the curl command. And this is how a, a, a server sent event HTTP connection works behind the scenes. Just every so often, whenever, however often the server wants, it sends the word data, a colon, it sends some string, which in this case, for simplicity, I have uh, made JSON encoded, and then it sends a blank line. That's it. There are a couple little extra bits it can do. I think you'll see a, a colon alone go by occasionally. That's being sent as a keep alive mechanism by that SSE channel. So there's a, a couple little bits in there to try to have a uh, slightly better user experience. But this is really all there is to it. The, the SSE protocol is very simple, very robust. And unlike WebSockets, it tends to work just seamlessly through almost any kind of network infrastructure or firewalls. Okay.
So uh, one more variation, just to show that you don't have to do it quite so slow. So I have this variation that sends data every 10 milliseconds. So if we end up coding some really interesting code uh, down the line here a little bit in the, in the following videos, that uh, you know, we, we might be able to, to see some, some data update quickly on the screen. OK, so that's it for this video. Uh, just do my reminder here. I'm Kyle Cordes, Oasis Digital, Angular Bootcamp. Please subscribe to our channel or go to our playlist and you'll see the following videos. And I think all the rest of the videos are really going to be about Angular 2 instead of only being out about the source of the streaming data. So thanks for watching. Bye bye.